Hello, I am Baby Flapola and I'm just a boy and I like to play with chickens all day. Sometimes I go up to the mirror and I look at my face and I wonder what it represents and why it is the way it is and what it is made of. Is it made of that vegan hot dog that I ate last week? If materially I am made of the food that I consume, then spiritually I am made of the ideas that I have read. So today I'm gonna review the five most recent books that I've read and their common theme is language. It's gonna be three science fiction books and two theoretical works. I hope you will enjoy. If not, I will kill myself. Ba, 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 ra, so the first book that I'm going to review today is His Master's Voice by Stanislaw Lem from 1968. And Stanislaw Lem was a guy who wrote about um, the possibility of understanding alien life quite a lot and this is one of its best known novels and it's basically written as a kind of memoir by this famous mathematician Peter Hockhart who was one of the key figures in a pentagon directed project called his master's voice to decode a extraterrestrial transmission that was sent to earth and um, the novel is just a philosophically dense um, illustration of all the problems and paradoxes of language that basically render this project unsuccessful. And it's a very interesting read. It's, it's like, it's kind of like those old H.G. Wells novels where you have like you know, H.G. Wells, where you basically have like, um, you know, a story, but then you also have like those kind of essay parts that kind of try to, you know, theoretically explain the background of what is happening and stuff, you know. And yeah, so that makes this book not really the most exciting read from a story perspective. But it's very interesting from a theoretical perspective because especially if you're interested in the philosophy of science this is a very very nice and concise uh, illustration of how the dialectics of science work because this mathematician that is the protagonist or the narrator of uh, this story was basically hired as a theoretician if that's a word uh, who tried to find holes and the arbitrary elements in the existing theories from all of the other scientists that, you know, about that extraterrestrial transition, transmission. And, and so the book includes many debates about, you know, philosophy and cosmology. It basically intensifies those two and so we get many debates between the scientists that are involved in the project about um, just epistemology, philosophy of science, systems theory, probability, ethics, biology, just you know everything that has anything to do with such an endeavor. And it's a very interesting read because Lim was very aware of the problems of ever understanding a being that has a psychology, a biology, environment, culture that are just radically different than our own. Now story-wise there's a very interesting segment, basically the beginning of the book, where you get to see how exactly the human civilization found out about this transmission like how to, did we spot it you know to students of astronomy i think they just they happen to get an observatorium for themselves so they can collect some data of radiation i think what's i'm, I don't, I'm not a scientist but then they have a friend who makes like a lottery ticket algorithms and apparently the book says it's very hard to write like algorithms that are truly um, random 
in what they generate. So this person had the idea to get those that data that those two friends, those two students collected from the observatorium about the radiation that is just thought to be some random noise. Um, so he could transcript that data into, you know, three separate algorithms for lottery tickets. And yeah, they give him that data and he writes up those three algorithms and he, you know, sells those algorithms to lottery companies. And then he gets sued because apparently he made two of the same algorithms and he's like, no, I wrote three. And you know, then, then there's a whole case about that. And, um, and then the, there's some crazy person that's obsessed with aliens and he hears that and he's like, oh, what, what if that is actually a message by aliens? And this is not just a random radiation, but it's, it's actually a sequence that is being transmitted to us repeatedly. And, you know, then, then he comes to the court with that idea and then, you know, the, just by chance there's a, uh, there, there's a reporter who sees that and he's like, oh, fuck, this is hilarious. And then he writes an article about it. And then just by coincidence, there's a physicist that reads the local newspaper because he found it on the bus and he just sees that story and he, he finds it very amusing but then he's also like oh but i know this observatory and what if i would just i don't know what if i would just check you know and then you know and then gradually like the whole like you know the whole society of scientists get to know that fuck this is an alien transmission from space to us and then project his master's voice which is a highly secret pentagon directed project as mentioned takes place and from then on they just try to decode the message like if you're interested in epistemology philosophy of language philosophy of science this is perfect perfect so the first book was by Stanislaw Lem. The second book is by Stanislaw Lem, Polish writer. And um, this is by far his best known work. Um, again, it's about understanding uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. And well, we follow the story of a psychologist, Chris Kelvin, who goes to the Solaris station. Now, what is the Solaris station? This story is happening in some really, really like far future where we find a planet called Solaris, we call it Solaris. And it is just a planet that is covered by a gigantic ocean. And then they start to wonder whether it's alive, whether this is a form of life that they don't know. And um, yeah, then we learn about like 100 years of a science called solarism that just starts out with, you know, people being like, okay, this is an ocean that is behaving weirdly, but surely we can explain that behavior with, with our current like physics and biology. And then you have like 20 years of scientific research that tries to account for what's going on on that planet with a materialistic theory of Solaris. And then like uh, a scientific, uh, scientific revolution happens, so to speak. And people start to view the ocean as a biological alive entity. Then basically they try to understand the psychology and behavior and the you know evolution of this so uh, ocean and for 30 years or so they try to account for that um, ocean via this biological theory of solaris and then you have another uh, scientific revolution when when they view uh, this um, ocean as some kind of uh, physical entity again so the point is, this is again a book by a person who 
I was very interested in the philosophy of science, philosophy of language and epistemology. And he describes those theoretical swings of, you know, viewing the world through a lens of one worldview and scientific cluster of theories and then another one and then again another one and so on. And yeah, this is the background, which this time it's perhaps more in the background <laughs> like the story the actual story follows the psychologist chris calvin who goes like after hundreds of years of you know studying this um planet humanity kind of you know gave up it's like okay sure it's just a plan or whatever we don't need to understand solaris and then they just move on and solarism kind of becomes a dead science nobody's really interested in it again um, but this psychologist, uh, Chris Calvin, is still kind of interested, he still wants to understand and um, he goes to the Solaris station that's on Solaris and there are just two lone scientists who really just, you know, nobody really gives a shit about what's going on in Solaris anymore and stuff but as the psychologist, the protagonist, quickly realize those two scientists are behaving really, really weirdly and something seems to be very far off. And when he's like on the station for some time and it seems that the ocean finally wants to make the first contact with humans, but again and again like humans are trying to understand what the hell is going on and what kind of approach is this and whether he really wants to communicate this entity or whether it wants to like you know torture it them or whether it's just a, i don't know whether it's just a natural phenomenon again and you know they're just struggling to make a you know concise theory about what the hell is going on in this planet and you know it's it's a very um, uh, very interesting read. Like not only theoretically but also story-wise, it's very it's very um, like uh, dramatic. It's very you know no, that's not the right word. It's very uh, you know tense. No, that's not the right word. I don't know English. Ah, you know like when something is uh, ah like action stuff. No, not not action stuff. Fuck. Like when it's. Uh, <clears throat> when you're like on the edge of your seat when you read it that kind of suspense it's suspenseful fuck it fuck yeah it's suspenseful that's what i wanted to say moving on it's not a good coffee but i just keep i just keep drinking it it's just like life. You believe it has no meaning, but you just keep living it. The next book I'm going to review is... Uh, I don't have the cover. I lost it. But yeah, the, the next book I'm going to re uh, review is, um, you know, Frankenstein. Everybody knows Frankenstein, I think, although not in this uh, version, the original version, perhaps. Uh, it was written by the 19-year-old Mary Shelley, which is just like... Like, this is, this reads so well. This reads so fucking well. It's amazing. Amazing book. Um, but what does it have to do with language? Now, this is a story about uh, a scientist, um, Victor Frankenstein. The book is, was written in 1818. 1818. And, um, yeah, before the story of this... Uh, scientist who was very interested in philosophy when he was young but then he saw that we can just you know go on doing philosophy forever and form alternative worldviews and whatever you will never really get at a system that will you know be objectively better than every other because this is just what philosophy has been since forever just alternative alternative new alternative new alternative and we never like get to a you know a visible progress 
that would just you know stay everything can get destroyed and Frankenstein sees a solution in science uh, especially in the life sciences um, because he believes that if you can demonstrate some actual like progress in the way we treat biological entities and how successful we are in manip manipulating them then you know this is reason enough to think that we have figured something out uh, and in fact there has been some progress and in that way science progresses why philosophy just stays um, back so yeah that's why he focuses on the life sciences and he basically he wants to prove everyone his um, superiority by mm, showing everyone that something can be done that nobody else has ever done before and it's constructing a new a life being you know and you know he he's like okay let's do that and he just you know he, he he's just focused it on focused on his work and he like picks up graves you know searching for the light the right human parts and stuff and then he assembles a you know a new you know new creature and then bam one day it, it it becomes alive he's successful and then when he's successful he's like fuck what did i do and why did i do that and he's actually terrified of what he has created because this being is just, you know, despicable and disgusting, according to Frankenstein, who is um, kind of the narrator of this story. But he is not really the most, he's not, <laughs> he's not the most uh, reliable narrator. You know, you can see through him and his disgust and see that perhaps this um, monster, this which is never called monster by the way it's 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 a diamond it's a diamond just like the ancient greek diamond yeah let's call it diamond it's a philosophical spirit um so yeah he's um this 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 diamond doesn't really seem to be that bad actually but of course uh frankenstein is he's terrified of this uh cr cr creature this creature creature what the fuck am i oh i don't know english so yeah this is this creature this is frankenstein i mean this is frankenstein's uh demon frankenstein is the scientist uh, no 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 not the demon diamond 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 it's a philosophical spirit so um yeah and basically uh frankenstein is like fuck this and you know what goes and um just leaves the creature behind and yeah, so this is the part that I want to focus on. So there's a beautiful 30 to 40 page segment where basically the diamond is left alone without a conception of what the world is, or what existence is, what culture is, what language is, what humans are, what he is. He's just completely like, you know, like a blank blank slate tabula rasa and he um, just hides and roams the world until one day he just stumbles upon a uh, family that lives in the woods and he decides to you know watch them uh, from you know far and you know hide himself and just observe what they do what they are what they want you know and now you probably see where i'm getting at this is a segment about communication and about understanding alien life but the perspective here is shifted now the diamond is the observer observer and we humans are the alien beings that he tries to understand and he observes how people make mo noises with their mouth and stuff and it's just like wow gnush glak brup right and then he kind of gradually makes out that these uh, noises are supposed to carry significance um, to other people and he tries to decode what those words are and what those people want and you know gradually through a you know long and diligent observance and studying of the people he learns their language, their culture, everything about them and stuff. And then he, you know, approaches them, tries to communicate with them, 
become a part of their family but of course they are absolutely disgusted by this foul creature that is just weird and they don't want to know about anything about it and they just react very violently towards the diamond and they're like whoa and yeah then then the diamond has to flee and then he's just um, angry and disgusted with himself and he wants to he wants to vengeance this to his creator who brought him into this painful existence i just thought that this segment is beautiful just beautiful done the next book i'm gonna review um now we had three science fiction classics but now i'm gonna go to two more theoretical works and the first one is culture and value by ludwig wittgenstein and yes i have also lost this cover <laughs> i eat them so if you have been watching this channel you have heard about this guy a lot i think and this this is just a selection of notes by ludwig wittgenstein so it's meant to be read as um, you know you just open it randomly and you read two or three quotes and then you close it and leave it on the shelf and maybe think about it for a while and then you know open again see what little ludwig was about again so the collection covers his life from you know his whole life but um it proportionally there's way more notes by the late wittgenstein so there's a lot on about you know uh, language games and world views and um, the way in which we engage philosophical questions from a uh, cultural standpoint um, and it's full of uh, illustrations and examples and even jokes about how to understand one of some of the things that he is saying because of course Wittgenstein tried to theoretiz theoretize if that's a word about language but he did that using language so of course um, the problems that he's discussing are like inherent in the you know very transmission that he's doing between the reader and him the writer so rather than just telling what he's all about he sometimes likes to show what he's about and um, that's also what I did with my video on language games, for example. I used various kits and, you know, settings to show what language games are about, rather than just um, telling what they're about. And yeah, the same is done by Wittgenstein, in, especially in these notes. So I'm gonna read some notes now, um, that would be the best thing to do now, I think. Um, just one of so, some of my favorites and um, the book opens up with a note from 1914 we tend to take the speech of a Chinese for inarticulate gurgling someone who understands Chinese will recognize language in what he hears similarly I often cannot discern the humanity in a human Okay, so here's some quotes that I found to be very rich material for just thinking about philosophy, language, life, everything. It's just, you know, it's, it's not solely about language, although, of course, it's Wittgenstein, so it's a lot about language. But it's not solely about language. He had a lot to say about ethics, about religion, about, you know, what life, about philosophy in general, science. A curious analogy could be based on the fact that even the hugest telescope has to have an eyepiece no larger than the human eye. The horrors of hell can be experienced within a single day. That's plenty of time. If I were to write a good sentence, which by accident turned out to consist of two rhyming lines, that would be a blunder. Okay, let's complement this last uh, note by something that he said in one of his lectures. Philosophy, as we use the word, is a fight against the fascination which forms of expression exert upon us. 
the extreme difficulty of philosophical problems are due to misleading analogies between similar structures of expression. Wittgenstein comes from a school of thought that saw how misleading and inadequate language is when we try to express thought and there's many grammatical laws of language kind of um, misled thinkers of from all over history into making um, logical mistakes and so on and uh, Wittgenstein basically wants to fight this fascination that just keeps so that's how I understand this quote in a conversation one person throws a ball the other does not know whether he is supposed to throw it back or throw it to a third person or leave it on the ground or pick it up and put it in his pocket etc and that's what his language games are about you say hi how are you and the other person is like hey i'm good how about you and you're like good right and we are playing the being polite language game if um you know you would just put some person that's not so socialized so to speak in this scenario and a stranger came up to him and he would be like hey what's up how are you you know that 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 person would be like okay what, what should i say um does he actually wants to know did i do something that you know he he he, he asked me am i am i am i uh, acting weird or what's going on the same goes if like you would go on the street and somebody asks you hey how are you and you would just go into him and, and <laughs> you're just like oh my god i have depression i'm gonna oh my god i can't this this life is horrible it's just <sighs> It never stopped. The demon never stop. They never stop telling me what to do. If it would be like that, you have just, you know, he's playing the being polite language game, but you're playing, I don't know what, but not his language game. You have totally, like, you went totally against the, you know, conventions of society. What is it like for people not to have the same sense of humor? They do not react properly to each other. It's as though there were a custom among certain people for one person to throw another a ball, which he is supposed to catch and throw back. But some people, instead of throwing it back, put it in their pocket. So yeah, it's just notes like that that just, I think, are very rich material to just, you know, think about from time to time. I found it very uh, stimulating. Um. I am a computer. <sighs> the last book I'm gonna talk about today is The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker from 1994. It's an introductory textbook basically to linguistics and psycholinguistics. Um, it's very clear, very, you know easy to read it has a ton of interesting illustrations and studies that confirms or either either confirm or go against some you know philosophical ways of thinking about language and it includes many themes like um, it covers the history of linguistics and philosophy of language and it goes on to some developments in technology how it, they help us understand language and many mental pathologies that helped us to understand what language is, how it behaves, how it ties to our, you know, psychological constitution. It also has some very interesting chapter on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and it's basically Pinker being against the idea that language radically determines the way in which we think. And he covers the whole history of the Sapir-Whorf uh, hypothesis and um, some of the controversies about the studies that were cited in people that were defending the view that languages radically influence or determine the way in which we think. Like, for example, I think it was uh, Whorf who 
studied the Hopi tribe and found out that their language has no concept of time whatsoever and he uh, postulated that basically the Hopi tribe don't experience time that was of course shown to be false the study they they do have some concept for time but he was just biased to some degree and yeah this book may be thick but it covers in 12 chapters 12 big ideas in philosophy of language psychology and uh, language so the intersection where the three of those in collide and Pinker is a psycholinguist he tries to figure out the relation between thoughts and language uh, in a uh, highly systemized way now the overall idea of this book is to defend a view that language is innate in human nature the same way like spiders have the instinct to make webs humans have an instinct to form language is pinker's idea it is hardwired in the you know way our brains are made up this is something that he's following um, uh, Chomsky's school of thought Chomsky was very critical of the behaviorist uh, like conception of language that was um, especially language ex acquisition that was thought to be adequately accounted for by just uh, stimuli and reaction but then Chomsky showed um, that well you can't really account how three-year-olds can also already make like com complex syntactical structures um, if not by the fact that their like brains are already hardwired to um, you know ad adapt for some linguistic structures and make them you know make them basically acquire language in means not by means of not uh, nurture but just their nature Pinker is very skeptical towards the skeptical challenges that we have mentioned, for example, the Quine's radical translation or Wittgenstein's paradox or Wittgenstein's beetle on the box. But Pinker thinks that if language is something that is controlled by the way in which our brains are hardwired and if we share a you know, very similar psychological constitution then we could maybe say that when children learn language their psychology makes them focus on the same relevant features of the world that their parents found relevant enough to name them and in that way they can learn si uh, science and you know any sign system effectively but of course that's um up to debate um, maybe some parts of the books are a bit um, outdated like the chapter where, where he um, like talks about why it's um, impossible to construct a voice recognition um, device that could actually understand all of the words and transcribe them into you know the computer transcribing words into you know signs that that should be impossible but if you um, turn on the captions right now you will see this process happen uh, in real life by the youtube algorithm um so yeah some parts are outdated but still this is a very good i found it to be a very good introduction to um, some of the ideas about language and psychology and uh, i hope i found it to be a very informative uh, uh, informative read okay so that's uh, the five most recent books i have read if you found that interesting that's cool <laughs> but yeah maybe um now is your turn maybe you should uh, tell me or recommend me some books that i could read i'm um i have time i want to do some reading so please um i will be very thankful if you give me some suggestions um anything you like anything you think uh, i might enjoy as well Bye.